So can you guys remember that when you were a kid and you were having a really good meal with your favorite thing, you leave, leave the best for last? Yeah. Yeah, save the best for last? Yeah. Now you ate everything at the same time. Right? <laughs> well, for those of you who do remember, this is one of those moments. Um, I have been Bill for about half an hour uh, last week, and it was uh, like meeting a twin son from a different mother. Um, we have a lot in common. I'm not going to say too much to introduce him other than to say to you guys, enjoy him. He's going to pull a lot of things together that we've been talking about today, and I'm really happy to have him here. So, Bill, without further ado. Well, thank you very much. Is the audio, if you hear me okay? Canada. Uh, is that an issue? <laughs> I've already heard one gentleman say, you know those Americans what they say. Uh, and I, I apologize if I, I talk to anybody that I, I don't pronounce your name correctly, uh, but it's uh, uh, my bad. I want to talk today about why capability is really the key here and not only skill. And that picture of that little girl up there is really the, the essence of what I want to talk about. That little girl is doing what? But what is she learning how to do? Walking. Now, do you think when she learned to walk that the first time she fell down, she laid down and said, I'm not doing this anymore. This is not going to work. She got up, right? Now, how many times do you think she fell down and got up, fell down and got up? Many, many, many times. So I'm going to be talking about a concept around that called self-efficacy. And there's a big part of this plays to what that little girl does is that when we were small, when we were learning to walk, if there was an obstacle, we just did what? Got up and kept going. So I'm going to talk about how that ties into capability. But I'm wondering, how many of you have your PMP? Of course. Do you know that a PMP is nothing more than a driver's license? So there are people who have a driver's license, and my wife is at the back. When my daughter got her driver's license, the first thing she did with the car we bought her was smash it up. I swear that she was dating the guy who did the evaluation because she shouldn't have cut her driver's license. <laughs> but the point here is, is that a PMP may be helpful, it, it's an accreditation. Does anybody have their PGMP? The program management piece? No? Okay. Uh, and all of you, all of you are card carrying members of PMI, right? I can assume that? Okay, good. The point I want to go, the reason that's important is the provocative question for me, for you, is you are one of two people. Are you a project manager who is a professional who happens to work for the company you work for today? In other words, do you make judgments based on the professional nature of what you do? Or are you somebody who simply works at a company and you happen to be doing project management? What's the difference? <coughs> are you a professional who happens to work for the company or are you somebody who works in the company who happens to be doing project management? What's the difference? Subtle but important. You choose your profession or not. You make decisions based on what? What's right for the profession. You make decisions on based on what's, what's the proper thing to do for governance. If you are somebody who is an employee who happens to be doing project management, how do you make decisions? Perhaps. Based on what? The culture, the environment, the pressure, the stakeholders, the perhaps even the, the what the sponsor. You're not making decisions necessarily based on uh, what's just, what's right for the profession. Everybody with me? Now put your hand up if you are an A. Okay. Put your hand up if you're a B. Okay. Good. That gives me an idea of, of how we're, we're working here. So what I want you to think about doing here is when you invest your money for your resources, for your, for your training, how much money do you spend every year on training, roughly? Personally, though. No. Roughly, how much? Thousand bucks, two thousand bucks, three thousand bucks? How much? Five thousand bucks. Anybody spend more than five thousand bucks? Ah, more than five thousand bucks. Good. So the, the whole idea is the, the business decision on doing that is, is training an expense or is training a, 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 an investment? It's an investment, it is. But do you think that most people pursue, uh, 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 frame it that way? Not really. So what I want you to think about is not only learn it as a, a, an expense or not an expense but as an investment, I want you to start thinking about capability versus skill and they're different. 
Capability is a future-looking, outcome-based approach versus a output-based approach. Now, RP, it was with me in a program with Phillips. Did anybody know who Phillips are here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm being silly. I work a lot of work for them. The point is, is that um, the, the, the notion of, of, of looking at only outputs versus outcomes is a major differentiator of excellence in Phillips. In other words, if you're a PM and you're only focused on outputs, what's going to happen? You're going to deliver the output, but what is the business folks and what are the product people, what do they want? Outcomes. They want outcomes. So your, your focus on outcomes means you're focused on value. You're not only doing the deliverable. It makes a dramatic difference. So I want you to start thinking about why that's important. Because at the end of the day, and if I, get, if I had to do this in a short way, the first point here is whatever got you where you are today is not going to get you where you want to go. Is that fair? Whatever you, does anybody here have an MBA? How long ago did you get your MBA? Too long. Uh, 15 years. So what has happened in the last 15 years? And how relevant is that 15 year old information? Somewhat relevant, but is it possible that information becomes dated, training becomes dated? Absolutely. So uh, what you did before is not necessarily going to get you where to go, where you want to go. I also believe uh, that <laughs> Learning is a process, not an event. What does that mean? Learning is a process, not an event. You do, but how long does it take to learn something? Is it one day? It, in theory, you go to a class, you don't learn a damn thing in the day. How long does it take for you to actually learn it? It could be two years, but the point is you need to revisit the information. It takes days before you learn it, right? So the idea is for learning to become actually learned, it takes a while. It's a process, not just uh, attending an event. The third quick answer is uh, outputs are more important than, uh, uh, outcomes are more important than outputs, uh, and you need to invest wisely. Uh, and if you have the right capability uh, at, at age one, can you develop that same capability uh, how old you are? How many of you are baby boomers? Baby boomers, born after 1946. Ah, so now, uh, resonate here. Yeah. So, uh, it's a long while since you were white, so I, I think I have enough to adjust a bit. Roadmap for today. Because you're project managers, I'm going to put this in a roadmap format. I'm trying to help you. So, uh, I'm going to talk about quickly about the investment. Has anybody heard of the term VUCA? What does it mean? Volatility, yep. uncertainty, <laughs> complexity, you can read, I know, ambiguity. But the point though is, what's the problem with ambiguity or, or with VUCA? What's, what's, what's happening? Is it going faster or slower? Faster. VUCA, the, the, the rate of change is faster, right? So if the rate of change is faster, what does that do to your level of anxiety? Up or down? Up. And if I said to you, the principle here that you probably picked out of the human factor, either the gorilla insights or the complexity, is that a anxious brain is a resistant brain. We'll repeat that. An anxious brain is a resistant brain. So how does that help you be a better project manager if you know an, a an anxious brain is a resistant brain? Well, if I, have, if I put somebody under stress, and my mother used to say, Billy, do not make a decision when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. <laughs> and that's what she did. Now the point is, uh, in the environment, is the stress caused by the fast pacing, fast pace of life causing anxiety? Yes. And does it affect the way we think? Yes. So I'm going to give you some tools and strategies on how to minimize that in terms of that capability piece we're talking about. I'm going to talk to you about a snowman. I know that's probably something foreign to you folks here in uh, Amsterdam. Do you get any snow here? Yes. Yeah. When? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just asking you. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about this, this word efficacy uh, in more detail here in the process. Then I'm going to talk to you about five things I think you need to invest in. One is your IQ. Your IQ got you through school. Your EQ is going to get you through life. It doesn't matter how smart you are. What's more important is what? Well, how, how you connect with other people. So the EQ, the SQ, and I'm going to expand that for you because it's a lot bigger than just EQ. The next is, 
learning a journey. I, I want to talk to you about learning as you go and getting feedback and becoming an agile learner. How many of you are experts in agile? Uh, Somewhat, okay. Uh, we're going to talk about how agile uh, and learning go together dramatically because it's, it, it is a differentiator of you in the future. Those of us who learn fastest and adjust quickest are the ones that are going to go to the top. Does that make sense? Because if you can't adjust to VUCA and what's going on, then that's going to be the living thing factor. The next thing we're going to talk about is politics. The point here is, I just finished a, a, a thing with the top IPM in Phillips about political savvy. What's the this? Why do you need to have political savvy anyways? As, as a project manager. You know, you do. Now, we're going to talk about the, 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 the polls. There's a, a manipulation side of, of politics, and then there's an ethical part of politics. <laughs> My mission here is to convince you that politics is important. If you can't play politics, you're going to get played. That is the hard truth in the process. I'm going to give you some tools and how you can uh, adjust to them. The next thing is mindfulness. Does anybody here practice mindfulness meditation? Why? It keeps you sane. But the point here is, it's not about whether it's mindful. Everybody thinks mindfulness relaxes you. Mindfulness is very important because it helps your prefrontal cortex be focused more effectively in what you need to do. Why do you get hired? Do you get hired for your emotional brain or do you get hired for your rational brain? Both, but it's your rational brain. And what happens if you're always anxious and you're always anxious and, and anxiety ridden? Do you think as clearly as you could? Answer is no. The point, though, is at the end of the day, what are the benefit? What are the, uh, the, the business people chasing? Value. How many of you read the annual report of your company, page uh, start to finish every year? Start to finish. Why do you read it? No, no. I was, the gentleman behind you. You read it. Cover well, cover? I read it, but the most uh, interesting thing is when they tell the story to the capital markets. Correct. The analysts, how the analysts respond to it, and how they every year uh, have a slightly. Does it give you insights into how a lot? A lot. Uh, I was in the I was in the banking business uh, for 35 years. I had 38 jobs in 35 years. One of my jobs was lending money to businesses, corporations, and one of the big factors in play was. Uh, I always, I would never lend money to anybody if they didn't have a strong management team. That was absolutely important. How did I find out the information that they really had? It wasn't in the interview. I read the annual report. That was a big factor in the decision making process. At the end of the day, uh, just before we leave here, because I know I'm standing between you and your refreshments, so I know that, is a call to action. Something that I want you to do. I've got five of them in the process. So, let's start. VUCA. If you want to read a really good book, book by Johansson, it's about how, what VUCA is and where it came from. Highly recommend that book. Because is VUCA a reality for you? It is. You can either be paralyzed by this, or you can be energized. What do you think most people are? Paralyzed. And what I'll do, I will uh, send a list of uh, uh, websites and book references that you can post up after this presentation that you can access that supports some of the stuff I'm talking about. Does that help? I'd be happy to do that. Uh, so this particular book, and it's not a big book, it's not, it's not that thick, but chock full of good stuff. VUCA is about the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. The point, though, is, is uncertainty the enemy of commitment? Is ambiguity the enemy of commitment? Will people commit if they don't understand what you want or what the pieces are? The answer is no, they won't, right? And how does trust get created uh, through complexity? And project managers are already, already grown, already made to deal with this. What do project managers provide that is the antidote to volatility? Starts with um, V, vision. If you provide the, the, the people in the project at all levels a vision, how does that affect volatility? Well, if I know we're going to a certain place and there's ups and downs, am I okay with that? The answer is absolutely yes, right? How many projects and programs, and I do a lot of consulting work, have a well-crafted vision of where, what it's going to look like when we're done? The answer is few. 
It's, it's a, a very simple thing. Number two, what you do is, what do you do that deals with uncertainty starts with a R? Risk management. So you're tailor-made to reduce the risk factors or the uncertainty in an organization. Complexity. What is your antidote to complexity? Variety. Pardon? Variety? Uh, it could be. Well, it start, it starts with W. Structure. Work breakdown structure. You break it down into pieces. That reduces complexity, right? And what is your defense? Well, how do you enable ambiguity to be tamed? Do you ever, it, have you ever been criticized for being having too much structure and too many forms and too many templates? You may have, but what, do, what does that structure do for uh, ambiguity? Is it really better or worse? It reduces ambiguity. So project management is probably one of the few professions that actually does have something constructive for Google. Does that make sense? No, but I'm very fast. Sometimes. Okay, I'll slow down. I need to catch up later. I'll slow down. Do you want me to rewind the tape? <laughs> <laughs> I will slow down. Uh, I will slow down. But uh, it's my opinion, sir. There That's okay. No, I, I was about to put my hand up and say, am I going too fast? But I don't have to do that now. <laughs> so, go ahead. Question. question. Yeah. With VUCA, communication, can it also help? It's the, it is the lubricant of all of it. So, visioning <coughs> lubricated by communication. Uh, risk management and communication, lubricated by communication. All the way, lubrication, lubrication, lubrication. Communication is, is pr principally valuable right in the process. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, capability and that skill. This snowman, at the top of the snowman is a mindset. The middle of the snowman is a skill set, and the bottom of the uh, snowman is a tool set. What that means is, is that the mindset is how you see the world. It's your, how your, uh, your perspectives are. Your skill sets are things like what? What is a skill that you may have as a PR? Well, give me a skill. Facilitation. What else? Communication skills, et cetera. At the bottom are the tool sets that you have, that you use to get leverage in the process. So <laughs> you're, you're acquiring tools. You're building a skill set, developing it, but most importantly, you're resetting mindsets that may not work. What happens if you avoid conflict like the plague? You don't like conflict. Is that uh, an enabler or a disabler? Because is conflict an ingredient for collaboration or is it an impediment? No, is it? Is conflict an impediment or an ingredient? Ingredient. Now, if you have the if you have the mindset that conflict is a um, impediment, what's that going to do to your ability to resolve conflict? Lower it. But if you have the idea I'm going to embrace conflict as an ingredient, I have a different approach. That's an example of mindset. Everybody with me? So mindset, tool set, skill set. Here's the trouble, though. On the left hand side here, I'm going to show you. There, are, some of us diminish people by thinking we are the smartest. We believe that we don't like diversity or conflict. We believe that we'll treat people like a pair of hands, and all we want is compliance. Has anybody ever worked for a diminisher in their careers? Yes? How do you feel when you work for a diminisher? Diminish. <laughs> Even the people, I got it. So, if that's the case, uh, if you're under pressure, are you likely to be a diminisher? If you're under stress, are you likely to be an administrator? Absolutely right. Yeah. A multiplier says, no, 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 uh, I'm not the smartest, we are the smartest, so it's a collective. They say, instead of diminishing diversity, a multiplier multiplies it. A diminisher wants a partner relationship, not a pair of hands. Oh, by the way, what do we mean by pair of hands? What is that? Somebody do what I want you to do, yeah. Right, what, what does it mean to have a partnership relationship? We're together, right? Uh, the, the, the multiplier is looking for commitment, not compliance. Most importantly, the, the multiplier is focused on outcomes and not outputs. Okay? Now here's a tool that you can use right off the bat. That lower right hand corner, you'll see MEDIC, N-E-D-I-C. It is an easy way of translating output into value. In other words, whatever you deliver is either going to maintain something for the company, eliminate something for the company, decrease something for the company, increase something for the company, or create something for the company. If I took your job and your salary, I bet you I could triple your salary by using Medic to explain to the organization how much more value you produce than your people. 
Now, if you do that, it's only going to cost you $9.99 US. <laughs> so netting is a very important way as a PM to be able to say, okay, what is it maintaining? What is it eliminating? What is it decreasing? What is it increasing? What is it creating? How is that going to affect your relationship with the business folks? I'll slow down a bit more. Is that how does that affect the relationship with your business folks if you understand the outputs that are being expected? How does that set you apart? <coughs> Instead of the deliverable, you've got the deliverable, but you're able to talk about what does that deliverable maintain? What does that deliverable eliminate? Or eliminate? What does that deliverable decrease? What's the value of that? Added value, that's what value is all about, right? So the process, so I want you to think about, for example, medic, and I'll, I'll, I'll send you a little blurb on medic as well in the process. Okay, let's talk about efficacy. Efficacy is about your one-year-old belief that you can get things done. So on the right-hand side, let me talk about this. Efficacy is your capability to get something done. Self-efficacy means you have a belief that your capabilities are such that you can solve a problem no matter what. So what happens if you believe there is no problem or issue that you can't deal with? What does that give you? Self-confidence, right? And collective efficacy is the same thing for a team. If a team believes there's no problem they can't solve, what's the advantage? What's the advantage of that? There's literally no problem. There, there is literally no problem. Now, the idea is I need to build that self-efficacy in people. If a person with a low belief in their abilities or self-efficacy, as soon as they run into a problem, what do they do? Quick, stop, stall, help me. Or if I have a group of people on my team that have high degrees of self-efficacy, how do they uh, respond then to a problem? They, they move into it, they, they move towards it, they don't move away, right? So efficacy is made up of three things. Your brain. All of you have a brain, and what I would suggest you start doing is, first of all, understand your brain, and you've had a lot of stuff here on the brain. More importantly, in, in addition to understanding your brain, you have to observe your brain. Why do you have to observe your brain working? <laughs> yeah, because you know what's going on. The brain, the brain doesn't consult you, right? And the last thing you need to do is direct your brain. What do you think mindfulness does? helps you direct your brain more effectively from a prefrontal cortex. Brand. How many of you have heard about personal branding? Okay. Your personal brand is, a, is made up of three things. It's your promise. What are you known for? What do you stand for? And what are you capable of becoming? If you have a strong brand, why is that so helpful to, ever, to you as a, a person? If you have a good, a good reputation, what are, you, what are you trying to do all the time? Credibility. And if you want to protect your brand, you want to grow your brand, you want to, you know, you'll do anything not to let your brand be sullied, right? Lance Armstrong, what was wrong with his brand? He was, he was very capable, he had a, a, a great technique and skill, but what did he not have? Character. So the idea here is, I, I have a brain piece of efficacy, I have a brand piece, and the last piece is how high are your standards or how low are your standards? Do you have high standards for quality, performance, uh, and, and success? So put your hand up if you have high, 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 qual or high standards for quality, performance, and success. Where did that come from? Did you learn that in school? <coughs> or uh, 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 where did that come from? <clears throat> it might be. In, in, in my research, I'm, I'm seeing that baselines in your, in your standards come from, from interesting places, so it's important to, to think about that. I believe that most people's standards are too low. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that one of the things a leader can do is begin to raise the baseline for standards, because if you have high standards, will your self-efficacy beliefs go up? What do you think? They will, right? They go up. Dramatically. And have you ever seen a case where somebody does something and the standards the, of their standards is different than your standards? And you didn't clarify? Happens all the time. So self-efficacy is a big factor in play here. Self-esteem is how you feel about your holistic feeling of worth in the process. And it's different. 
Let's talk about five areas. One, your IQ. I'm going to go through these pieces of conscious of your time. Let's do your IQ as our up first. There are, are three other cues. First of all, you got hired based on a certain level of uh, intellectual ability called IQ, enough to get in the door. Is that is that true? You you are all smart people, right? Yeah. Correct. So the point here is the. The, you know, the threshold skill is about thinking. I want you to think about uh, connecting with people. Have you ever heard of the term social capital? What is social capital? Trust-based relationship among people. You hate the boss, the organization is not good, but why do you come to work? Because you like the people you work with and you trust them. Right? That's social capital. That's what EQ uh, does and SQ does. Lower left hand corner is the whole cultural piece. It's cross cultural, it's cross organizational. And that cultural quotient is a big factor. My favorite is the PQ factor, which is something I've invented, but it's still true. It's your passion quotient that says, Are you going to be self directed in pursuing what you want to pursue? Your cues, the other cues, are the things that will make a dramatic difference in the process. And spending time developing those will be a good idea. Does that make sense? So, IQ got you through school, the rest of the cues will get you through life and your business and your performance of you. Yeah. <laughs> Number two, learning agility is the new differentiator. What that means is, I, I want you to think about, you come to the table with your raw experience, your, your uh, degrees, it doesn't matter what it is. Your experience is what shapes that, that learning. At the end of the day, that's how you become more, have more potential. Does that make sense? Are you an agile learner and have you grown with that, with that experience? Your brand is what you stand for, what you're known for, and what you're capable of becoming. We view you uh, through your brand. I repeat that makes sense. So what I want you to think about uh, from a learning uh, 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 agility point of view is uh, a concept of what I call prime. In other words, uh, performing is about work, being able to work under stress. <coughs> Why is it working under stress will improve the way that you learn? Why is that? You're challenged. You're challenged. And you're, 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 you get used to working under pressure. The R is reflecting, is being hungry for feedback, always getting feedback. Why do people hesitate to get feedback? It could be negative. What am I going to do if it's negative? Innovating. They challenge the status quo. <coughs> Monitoring your, your defensiveness. What is the prime reason that we, we don't respond well to feedback? We get defensive. Yes? And what's wrong with being defensive? What's not working when you're being defensive? Your, your, your listening skills, your brain, your processing. And lastly, exploring new things, uh, being able to take chances. Has anybody heard of the term sailing perpendicular to the coastline? Our, the, in the 1700s, everybody sailed parallel to the coastline. Why did they do that? Because it was flat. Yeah. Columbus had the order to, by Queen Isabella, right? I think it was her. Sail perpendicular to the coastline. Go straight out. And that's what I mean by this exploring thing. Uh, don't sail uh, perpendicular or, or um, parallel to the coastline. The point here, though, is I now have. Oops. I now have uh, a strong ability to, to learn uh, effectively. Now I enter the world of politics. What's the problem, or what's the opinion of politics right off the bat? Good or bad? Bad. Bad. Why is it bad? Is it possible that you've misunderstood politics? It's, it is possible, right? So I want you to go to think of politics in three different dimensions. One is the typical thing about power and organizations and how it works. I think we all get that. But I want you to think about interpersonal savvy. What do you think I mean by interpersonal savvy? Getting along with people. Why is getting along with people such a, a, a powerful thing? Social capital. Yeah. So uh, is, is that one of the PM strings that you learn in the PIMBA? 
getting along with other people. Eh, some, but not exactly everything. And then lastly, how much do you understand about your organization and how savvy are you about that? Is it possible that understanding your organization, being interpersonally savvy, enables you to be more politically savvy? And the answer is absolutely. And I can send you an article on this that will help you begin to make sense of this, because at the end of the day, uh, it's either manipulation, which is what we all think politics is, or it's ethical influence. What's the difference between ethical influence <coughs> and manipulation? Intention. Intention. You got it. So the point here is, is, is it possible to work in that gray scale between the two and still get things done and still be able to uh, sleep at night? And the answer is absolutely. Most PMs think that politics is what? Manipulation. And it's not. And when you learn it, and just to, to help you there, the characteristics of a savvy person are these. You put the organization first. You believe and you care about what's going on. Uh, your career is an outcome, not a goal. What does that mean? Career is an outcome, not a goal. Yeah, you do your job. You're not out to get the big promotion. You're doing your job and the promotion will follow in the process. Well, that's all this. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's the spectrum. Now, did you see the limelight and the leading from behind the scenes there? Politics is leading from behind the scenes. What does that mean? Well, it means I'm influencing, I'm helping, I'm suggesting, I'm supporting. What does limelight mean? I want to be a limelight leader. What does that mean? We talk about politics or covert leadership. No, I'm talking about in the, in the world of, of, of interacting with people, say politics, if I lead from behind the scenes, I'm helping people be successful. Right? That's COVID leadership. I'm sorry, I don't understand what you cover. What kind of? COVID leadership. Co uh, exactly. Uh, okay. Yeah. But landline, what is limelight leadership? It's leading from the front, right? Alexander the Great, follow me. Right. When I do uh, exercises in, uh, with uh, the top IQ group in Phillips, when I say, okay, we're going to break into four groups and George, you're going to be the leader. What does the leader do when I give him the pen? He takes the pen. What does he do? He stands up to the flip chart and starts to write and, and ask people for their input. What does that tell you about him? He can write. And, <laughs> and what, what is his style? Leadership or uh, a limelight from behind the scenes? Limelight. Now, what's the point of the limelight approach? What happens to the rest of the people? Just watch. Oh, watch, yeah. So, is it easy to get caught in that as a PM? Absolutely, in the, in the process. Organizations are human systems pretending to be rational. They're not rational systems in which humans work. If, that's a key thing of this talk, is organizations are human systems pretending to be rational. I'm going to keep going. Mindfulness, we've had, you've probably had some discussions here about mindfulness. But the whole point is, is that mindfulness is about, about an expression called equanimity. Has anybody heard of that term, equanimity? Equanimity is a, is a term that says that you're able to accept what has happened or what is without judgment or, 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 or resistance. In other words, uh, you know, I dropped the milk and the milk spilled. Uh, that means that I'm going to accept the fact that it's dropped and I'm going to clean it up. I'm not going to have a, 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 an explosion in the process. <coughs> The Buddhists have an expression called first start, second dart. Uh, first dart is uh, you drop the milk. The second dart is your reaction to dropping the milk. And which one of the two darts throws you off? First dart or second dart? Second dart. Uh, it, it happens all the time. So the point here is if I can manage this and become more able to concentrate, how is that going to make me a better PM, do you think? Well, equanimity is going to keep things calm right? in the process. A lot, a lot more calm. A good book is John Kabat Zinn. Has anybody heard or read anything from John Kabat Zinn? Yes. I'll put that on the, on the website or on the list. It's a very good book. Uh, one of the thought leaders, would you agree uh, in that process, Tom? Sorry? One of the thought leaders in that, in that space? Yeah, absolutely. And the book that, you, that you've got on there is. Uh, is a keeper. Yes. The fifth one, and I'm conscious of your time, uh, is that whole notion of value. Uh, medic is a very simple way of getting to it. I teach benefit realization to, to organizations, and medic is a key strategy to understand benefits and understand outcomes.
and harvesting those benefits uh, in, the, in the process. Five things, call to action. I want to bring this back together again with the following. Um, oh, by the way, are there any questions before I close this off? I know, you want to bring it. <laughs> Number one, I want you to commit to being a professional PM who happens to be working in an organization. That's what I, that, that would be one thing I would suggest to mention to management. It'll change your mindset. It'll change the way you respond to uh, uh, stakeholders. The second one is differentiate yourself, being agile, but recognize that learning is a process, not an event. When you go to a learning event, what do you do before you get to that learning event? Do you, do you Google the topic before you go? And the answer is? The very few people, I've done surveys of almost uh, many hundreds of people, and how many people Google the topic before they come to the class? Almost zero. You, but most people come to the class, what, empty. If they come with a little bit of stuff and I add more stuff, are they not going to have more stuff in the process? <coughs> Embrace mindfulness, uh, it is an enabler of both hard skills and soft skills. Soft skills have a hard impact. Uh, mindfulness is a winner. Uh, it's something that uh, is, e is simple but not necessarily easy. It's a matter of uh, being persistent. The fourth one is a concept that I, that I uh, use a lot, it's called team. Whatever you learn, teach it to somebody, expect them to do something with it, anchor it, and then model it, is a way of uh, implementing something. So teach it, expect it, uh, anchor it, model it. And what do you mean? Let them do the show. Well, model, you model the behavior. So in other words, I, I taught a new technique maybe for a problem resolution. I practice the techniques that I've, that I've done by modeling it when I go to you do something. I don't have a, another way of doing it in the process. And, and lastly, uh, the future proof your capability. My future proof comes back to this little girl that uh, that quality of there's nothing that you cannot master uh, and, and being immune <coughs> to MOCA is, is a key factor for success uh, in, in the process. It's been a pleasure. I hope you have a good drink and I hope you stay mindful and just remember that little girl when you learn to walk that's all you need to be successful. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Wow, what are you going to say after that? <laughs> um, thank you, Bill, for uh, letting us have a peek into your, uh, your mind and your own dynamics and, uh, and your world. I'm sure there's stuff for conversation afterwards um, that, you've, uh, that you've riled up. But thank you very much for this. I really appreciate it. And we all do.